Hey folks, Steve here with a special review video for you today. We're going to be looking at Precious Glory 1, a game designed by Bob Kalinowski and published by GMT Games. Uh, this is an older game. <laughs> it is over uh, 20 years old now, or is about 20 years old, which uh, kind of makes it for an interesting review video here in 2023. Um, this is... Uh, a game that uh, I decided to do a review on for, for a couple of reasons. One, it's a game that I've owned and I should have played some time ago. I just haven't gotten to it. And two, out of a recent Ardwolf Slayer stream from a few, uh, several weeks back now, uh, there was some commentary about Prussia's Glory. The fact that, well, by golly, it sounds like you could just find a copy in your local gas station's bargain bin. Uh, anywhere in the United States, because it's just that easy to get a copy. It's just out there on the secondhand market, because apparently nobody seems to want to keep the game. Um, and, and I took that as kind of a, a, a little bit of a challenge to say, well, you know, um, is that because it's not a good game, or is it because it's just not catching enough people's interest, and maybe there's a little bit of groupthink where games are unpunched, people don't play them, then they sell them. Because if you go to look, there are a number of copies of Precious Glory that you could get, and they're unpunched, which means that the people who are selling them never played them. Uh, so with that, uh, I had realized that, of course, my copy of Precious Glory was sitting on a on my game shelf, um, unplayed, unpunched, and it seemed like a really good time to correct that uh, situation. So I did. Uh, so this review is going to be based on my solitaire play of all four of the different battles featured in the game. Uh, we have Rossbach, Leuten, uh, Zorndorf, and Torgau. Uh, each of these scenarios have come in both a uh, main scenario, which allows you to do more maneuvering before the battle actually starts to happen, and then just the battle, which is focused on uh, when the fighting occurs. So there's a lot of different game experiences there, I have recorded uh, those playthroughs on the channel, um, some commentary, so if you like to watch those and get a sense of how the game kind of flows, uh, you can watch those videos. They're in a playlist here on the channel for Prussia's Glory. Uh, I will say also that if, for my review, I was playing with the Prussia's Glory 2 rules, which are technically the series rules, uh, which benefit from some refinements that were made to how the rules are explained. Uh, this series rules PDF is available on GMT's website. Uh, so I have an extra printed copy here that I self-bound. So I, I took you know, the effort to do this. I do have a copy of Precious Glory 2, which is, this is the same rule book, and I could have just used that, but I decided to print a copy here just in case I'm playing the game opposed. I have two copies of the rules, and I can keep one of these in my Precious Glory 1 box. Um, so, uh, there's that. Um, so, with this, I would just want to, uh, you know, uh, describe how we're going to go through the rest of this video. Um, we're going to hit on the mechanics of the game. So, if you've not seen my review videos before, uh, we have this intro. I do a explanation of the game rules and how the game works uh, in a somewhat uh, long explanation, just so everyone gets a good sense of how the game really does function. And then towards the end of the video, we have my sort of closing thoughts and, and really my assessment uh, of the game in total. But you'll be able to skip to that if you don't want to sit and hear the game rules explanations or how the game works. You know, when you've got it out on the table, you can just skip to the timestamp, which I'll show you here very shortly. Um, in, in terms of any other intro things to keep in mind, this game did get that sequel, Precious Glory 2, a few years later. Uh, neither of these games have been reprinted. The designer, Bob Klonowski, is still designing games. He had also designed Clash of Monarchs, which is a multiplayer CDG game on the Seven Years' War, so sort of fitting thematically. And then uh, just recently, in, in the last week, um, GMT has released Clash of Sovereigns, which is a multiplayer CDG on the War of Austrian Succession um, that he has designed. So Bob's still doing, uh, the, you know, games. Um, I think he's about done. He's he's done enough for the, the hobby, it sounds like. But uh, maybe there's a potential for these games to get a deluxe treatment all in one box like uh, GMT has done in the past. Given the availability on the secondhand market, I doubt that that's the case. But something to keep in mind, um, you know, if, you, if this game does end up interesting you by the end of the video, 
uh, you should be able to get a copy on the secondhand market for a reasonable price. Um, because again, they're just available out there in half, pri half price books uh, on eBay. Just nobody's bothering to play this game for some reason. And we'll, uh, we'll address that here in this video. So let's get it underway. Okay, so let's talk about uh, the game mechanics. I suppose before I do that, I want to touch very briefly on the components just very quickly so that uh, you can see. Um, the overall component quality of the game package is, is pretty fair. Um, so the game has two map sheets that come in the box and they're double-sided map sheets. So you functionally have four different maps, one map for each of the battles that are covered. And each of these maps is a standard 22 by 34 inch map. So in terms of table space, uh, it, it's a standard, you know, standard map. Um, nothing too crazy there. The game does come with some black and white sort of cardstock uh, player aid sheets that are helpful. Um, and they're reasonably well organized with various modifiers and charts. Um, so not that there's a whole lot to say there on the player aid bit, but... The play red card is serviceable. It's just black and white, which, I mean, at the time this was printed, that was kind of the, the more or less the standard or really only certain games got a more deluxe treatment. But again, very generally, um, the uh, the components are, are fair uh, and, and serviceable. The standard rule book, again, black and white, two-column format in the GMT style, really functionally replaced by the black and white uh, Precious Glory 2 series rules. The counters themselves, just to, to note an example, these are your white core, fair quality counters. I did opt to round the corners uh, on all of these counters just to keep them nice and clean looking because they did have a little bit of the nibs on the corners um, because these are not, you know, the higher quality counter sheets you sometimes get in some of the more deluxe treatment of games. This was just a basic production. Uh, so not bad by any means. The counters are, are quite uh, serviceable. They do exactly what they need to do. Um, I did like rounding the corners. That just helped uh, the quality and what they look like on the map, uh, which is a very aesthetic-related thing. Um, generally, the way that the charts uh, are organized, again, and the tracks that are on the map um, are well and clear and laid out. So just from a pure component to function, um, you know, the game works pretty well for that. Uh, and all the counters, the numbers, uh, are all clear, easy to read. Um, the one thing I will point out, and this is, this is one of those things that could very easily just be missed or something like if they were lazy, you wouldn't even see, but I just want to call attention. Like here are two different mounted cavalry units for the Prussians, the Freikorps Hussars and the 5th Dragoons. And if you look, each of the artwork bits for the counters is unique for these units, at least. And when I try looking around to see, like, you know, how often are we seeing, uh, you know, copies, basically, and you'd be surprised. Here's the same, here's the Freikorps Hussars again, but with the first Hussars, and even they're still different. You know, they could be considered palette swaps, but... You see, there is a difference in the hat of the guy on the on the counter. Like, the attention to detail actually is something to be very respected uh, here in in the package. Um, I think the closest thing you're going to see to copies are when um, there's infantry. But again, here's here's two different uh, infantry Prussians. They're still slightly different. You see the the pants on the unit to the left are lightly or are, are slightly more yellow than the white pants. Of the unit on the right. So I again, I just, <laughs> it's these little things that you kind of look at and, and you might be trying to figure out like just, it, you know, is there value in this level of detail? But I just think it's just, it's something to be praised here, right? Here are some Austrian cavalry. You can see the difference between the Dragoons, which have uh, their, their muskets and, uh, or they'd be, I guess maybe they were, these would be carbines, but uh, potentially, I, I'm not going to be an expert on that, but just, just these two different units, like there is a clear difference. You see the guy on the left, he's more of a heavy cavalry uh, for shock combat. He's got his uh, saber out. 
So just I just something I appreciated um, as I was playing through the game, just knowing that like each counter, even even within the same unit type, has distinct artwork, which I just really like because you know the reality is that you know it's not like it's um, like a total war game where every unit is just a copy and paste you know this is what a unit looks like kind of thing uh, from a video game they just all look exactly the same like they all varied a little bit um, from unit to unit or person to person and the fact that the game art just helps show that or at least you know pays some dues to that uh, it is very cool and again there they, you know there you're going to find some artwork that's reused in some of the cases but the variation here I just really appreciate so maybe that's a that's a you know, very unimportant factor. And and I could certainly see in many games where you just don't go to that level of effort. Here the effort was put in, and I think that should be praised or at least called out. Very cool. All right. So uh, how does the game work? Well, uh, this is uh, here a concocted scenario with some of the units that are in the aftermath of my last battle of Torgal. And I've just sort of rearranged them here for the purposes of example um, as you play through any scenario in, the, in this uh, package, you know, the, the battle is going to look very different from this. But just for illustrative purposes, I've manufactured this situation so we have something to talk to. And I'll zoom in at various points here and, and focus in on certain things. I'm going to run through the mechanics overall of the game in, in pretty quick order here. Uh, again, if, if you really want to dive deeper, you can read the rulebook. That rulebook is available on GMT's website. Um, but the way that the sequence of play is oriented is that every turn there is a Prussian player turn and then an, uh, a coalition player turn. And that coalition means you're either playing as the French, the Austrians, some combination of those two, or maybe the Russians in this game package. And when the coalition player turn is complete, there is a joint morale adjustment phase. And then you move in basically to the next turn. And how many turns there are depends on the scenario that you're playing. Each turn is basically an hour's worth of activity, um, and the I go, you go just being a uh, constraint of it being a war game, obviously. There is a little bit of um, activity of the opposing player on your player turn when it comes to artillery bombardment, which we'll talk about here uh, very shortly. The one thing I should call out uh, right here at the beginning, and, and it, it, is a, it is a mechanic that you may not end up using a whole lot, depending on how you choose to play the game, but usually at the beginning of a player turn, if you're playing a main scenario, meaning not the immediate battle, where the uh, forces on the map are potentially maneuvering, or maybe just one army is maneuvering while the other tries to get off its butt, um, is the army activation phase. And basically what it how it usually works is that the... Uh, Prussians will tend to be able to activate right away or sooner than their opponent, and then they can begin moving up to certain limitations. That whole time, the coalition player has the uh, option to spend morale, basically inflict morale losses on itself, to try to activate sooner. So this is the sort of, you know, hey, if I'm playing a war game, like I wouldn't let Frederick steal a march on me. I would do something different. Um, the game puts a little bit of uncertainty on that and also makes you pay um, to balance, you know, that. Because, hey, I mean, if, if the Austrians had not been caught by surprise at, say, Leuten or something, uh, obviously it would have gone much different. So there has to be a little bit of balancing in that. The way that basically works is when you go to activate, you're going you're gonna to pay a morale cost, and then you're going to roll a die. You're going to add the initiative rating of your overall commander, so in this battle example, we have uh, Frederick. That lower left number here, the four, uh, is the initiative rating of the overall commanding uh, leader there. And so we would roll a die, we would add four, and then if that is seven or higher, that army activates. So um, there are certainly battle setups or you know the scenario setups where the coalition player maybe doesn't have a very good leader, and their initiative is pretty low, which makes rolling a seven or higher very difficult, uh, which could mean that the Prussians have a pretty good opportunity to spend several turns on the march to get into their most advantageous position. But things could go lopsided uh, for them if the Austrians or whomever can activate and, begin, and can begin to at least adjust their position to face the Prussians on better terms. So 
that's part of the interesting tension of the main scenarios where uh, you'll need to determine how uh, you know how much do you want to spend morale for the chance to shift the battle outcome and the overall operational positioning of the army. So again, a neat little system. I, I kind of like it. There are, are some additional um, constraints to it, like in some scenarios like Torgal, you can have detachments out on the map which functionally serve as scouts that can be uh, basically set up uh, to spot the enemy sooner and then have those scouts try to run back to the main army to alert them and allow the whole army to activate. It, it's an interesting little system. I, I think a lot of folks could be either put off by it or confused by it. Um, in my mind, it, it, it's actually pretty nice for allowing the types of historical maneuvering to occur that Frederick did, but to also put in that pressure and uncertainty that I'm sure Frederick would have faced in trying to get his army into position. So that's a very neat aspect. And obviously, if you get very close to the enemy army, they can activate automatically, or that uh, ability to activate uh, becomes much easier. So um, it, it adds its own sort of mini game to it of trying to get into the right position for the battle and how that phase ends up, you know, when both sides um, are trying to activate, that is going to color the rest of the battle. When you play a battle scenario, both armies are considered activated and you don't do any of that. So this is a, uh, a mechanic that only applies in the main scenario. Uh, and again, it is, is kind of interesting. It's got, um, again, its own level of tension to it just outside the brawl of the battle itself. And that's something that I do appreciate uh, with this product as just, you know, adding a little bit of extra operational aspects to just the battle. Now, after an army is activated, uh, in, in then all the time in the battle scenarios, right, there's this command determination phase, which uh, here is when, if, if you have units moving in column, which we'll talk about here in a minute, you could uh, voluntarily take them out of column movement so that they can be in battle formation, but then what you're going to be doing is looking at your scenario information on the effectiveness ratings of the different formations in your command. And each battle tends to have some counters here, uh, these two being from Prussia's Glory 2 as sort of like clarification counters. But generally how it works is uh, each battle has a set of formations. Here the Prussians have a infantry group and a cavalry group. And they also have Frederick as a special leader. And the way that this works is each of those counters, uh, which are purely used as a mnemonic uh, and can be set up you know, anywhere on the map that's convenient, will show the dice range that when you roll a die for that group will determine if they're effective or degraded. Now, all that means if you're degraded is that uh, units that are part of formations in that group have only half movement. You would be surprised at how critical that is because often even in the battle scenarios where you're trying to get your forces into a good position or to make use of an exposed flank if for some reason you're you know you've rolled poorly and they're degraded you might not be able to get to where you want to get to in time to make use of it so it is nice that there's a bit of randomness there you nothing is for granted you can't be sure that your cavalry will be able to surge ahead with seven movement points and all of a sudden collapse a flank. It may be that they're degraded this turn and they're only going to be able to move three or four spaces and that will give the opponent time to adjust his line or to counterattack or um, improve their own position. So it is something that while it's a simple mechanic, it can have a lot of effect on the game map. And you'll notice that the game does have uh, formation uh, banner lines on the unit. So there's a red formation. Uh, the game refers to these as wings. I'm just calling them formations because I'm used to saying it that way from other games. But you have these wings. So there's like a gray wing, a green wing, a red wing, wing a sort of orange-yellow wing that each have their own uh, commanding officer here with a flag. And basically if the wing formation is all cavalry units, that's considered part of the cavalry group. If it's mixed, of infantry and cavalry or just infantry, then it's an infantry group and is thus governed by the uh, infantry range. So just something you want to watch out for 
and and basically how this will work is again that will govern their movement the special leaders like frederick in this case uh if he is and he's not set up this way right now but let's say i put him over here on this leader uh for the green formation here and they were co-located in the same hex if for some reason we rolled a die and the infantry rolled a four five or six they would very generally be degraded but with frederick present on the green leader's space with the green formation here we could then roll a die for frederick and basically get a second chance to treat the green formation the green wing formation as effective not all of the infantry just the one that the special leader is co-located with and this can be very useful where you know maybe you have a special leader uh, who's already the commander of a cavalry wing and that effectively means at least for that one cavalry formation they get two chances to be effective which means they're going to be much more mobile and capable on the battlefield so that's one of the ways that leaders uh, and good leaders differentiate from not as good leaders in this game. There is maybe a criticism to say, hey, shouldn't, you know, Frederick have a bunch of these other bonuses tied to him to perform better? I would point out that in this level of battle, you are functionally being Frederick or whomever the commanding officer is on the coalition side. And so the leaders will have their initiative rating for army activation and then their initiative rating, which is used for uh, effectiveness checks as a special leader. And then finally, that red boxed number that you would see there, and I'll zoom in and make that a little bit easier to see, that plus one is a morale modifier. So whenever units that are stacked with that leader have to deal with some sort of morale check, they basically get a little bit of a bonus to that. A lot of leaders, like this one down here, just have a zero. So they're just there functionally to ensure that uh, their units can activate and all of that stuff. Now, if for some reason a unit is more than five spaces away, hexes away from their wing commander, um, then those units are considered out of command and they also have a halved movement capability. And, and since we're just on the topic of being halved movement, if for some reason a unit is disordered, uh, then they're also halved movement, but that halving doesn't stack. So at worst, you know, this infantry unit here will only be able to move two movement points. At best, it will move three. Uh, while a cavalry unit here, half, it, at worst, it would be three. At best, it'll be five. So just keep that in mind. You could, you could be disordered, you could be out of command both, and you could be degraded, but you're never going to have lower than half movement speed, I believe is the case. So just something to keep in mind there. So again, you do your group command roll to determine who has full movement or who will only have half movement. And that's going to then determine, you know, what you're going to be capable of achieving in your turn as you move on to the movement phase. So when it comes to movement, uh, you know, each unit, um, as mentioned, has their movement factor down here in the bottom right. So three, five, five, ten for leaders sometimes. Depends on the leader. Um, you would then uh, basically be doing uh, your movement after you've determined who gets to move. Now, one of the things is a unit can become routed or disordered. If a unit is routed, you've effectively lost control of that unit until it can rally. And so any routed units at the beginning of your movement phase will have to move, uh, basically, you know, retreat as if they were uh, suffering a route result. So two hexes uh, for infantry, three hexes for cavalry. Um, so you'll have to do that towards a friendly map edge. Um, you'll also need to place these engaged markers on units that are adjacent to uh, enemy units at the beginning of movement. So here we might say those guys are engaged. And what that means is that the uh, unit that's at the top of that stack that is, you know, considered to be in the front of the frontage with the enemy will have to be involved in combat and can't necessarily disengage. Units that are in the same stack but lower in the stack and not part of the frontage uh, could potentially move out of there uh, with some penalties. But basically, if somebody's next to the to a, an enemy force, they are engaged in some level of combat, firing at each other, etc., and will be engaged for the movement. Um, here, it's important to be looking at that and go, okay, is this a bad matchup? And 
can I improve the situation by trying to uh, move units into place so that you know these guys can fight and then this guy can support this fight so these two hexes are attacking here just an example of the movement now you can imagine when it actually comes to movement things like moving up slopes like this is a slope down here uh, there are uh, streams and rivers and woods but these all use different terrain costs uh, there are different costs for cavalry versus infantry and artillery uh, and the player aid chart does cover that so very generally you can imagine you know the clear hexes are just going to be one movement point you can move pretty quickly but things like woods will take two movement points for infantry three for cavalry the terrain can slow you down um, and when you figure you may only have a couple of movement points per unit even one hex costing one or two extra movement points dramatically slows down your ability to move forward especially if units are degraded, you might not be moving very far at all. So that ability to move and how you move and making use of terrain is very important. And the terrain obviously uh, introduces combat penalties for attackers. So attacking across a river or into or out of woods can be uh, a major uh, a major consideration. Even towns like down here um, are terrain where cavalry will have a dreadful time trying to attack into or out of it. So you generally want to keep your cavalry uh, away from towns unless um, you're just using that town to uh, move through or, or something along those lines. So that terrain really does matter. How, how you're approaching, where you're choosing to fight will also be a pretty big consideration as you're going through and operating. Now, I do want to talk about the frontage mechanics here because uh, this is pretty important for the way the game works. So... Um, I'm going to adjust. I'm going to adjust the stack for a moment, and we'll we'll zoom in here. So the way that the frontage rules work is that again, when you're when you're looking at stacks, the top two stacking points, or the I'm sorry, the top four uh, steps in the hex uh, are the ones that are uh, at the front of your line in the frontage facing the enemy in the 500 yards of the hex that is closest to the enemy you could think of it as. So in this hex, we actually have a infantry unit that is two points, two stacking points. That's the top right number in brackets. We also have some hussars that are two stacking points as well. So, so technically, both these, both of these units right here would be engaged in combat with this Prussian unit. Uh, now, if we were instead having this unit at the top of the stack, it has three points, but the units that are underneath it may only be uh, two, and you can't fit more than four in that frontage. So in that situation, we would simply have this unit in the front. So this unit here, or this unit here, and then maybe these guys would also be involved in the combat, depending on the situation, but in this case, despite it being less than four steps, this three-step unit is the only unit that would be involved in combat. And, and in fact, there are limitations on how many strength points can actually be fighting through a hex side. Uh, so there's a limitation on that where, where very generally it's eight for infantry. And then, uh, and then there's a special, a couple of special cases where that's different and for cavalry, it's different. So something you're going to want to watch out for is just, you know, wh who's at the, fr you know, who's on the top of the hex that's going to fight. And then if that unit is hurt or forced to retreat, who is underneath it to continue fighting as the support units and how effective are they going to be at combat? So for some reason, this unit got eliminated or pushed away. Um, the units remaining in the hex would then be engaged instead. And then we would be having these two units fighting uh, against the uh, opponent here. There is uh, an ability during your movement to swap units. So we could have, and just for the sake of example, I'm going to move that unit out of here. Say we had these guys like so. This guy was fighting or had been engaged, and we wanted to swap him out and move him to the rear of that area. You could spend the movement points to 
uh, spend movement to do it and simply have these guys swap. But doing so means that there'll then be a combat penalty uh, for that stack. So you, you might say, well, then why would I ever swap them out if I'm going to receive a minus two penalty? You might need to do that to save a unit that just has no chance of continuing the fight and you don't want that unit to be eliminated for morale purposes. And the units that you're swapping to the top of the stack may be good enough to offset that penalty and at least keep the fight moving along. Um, so that's really the reason why you would do it. I've done it a few times in my battles where it was just better to try to swap somebody out rather than what, watch one unit get ground to dust or be forced to rout anyway. Uh, so try to get them out of there before they're totally routed. Um, is something that is worthwhile doing. Now, the way that the... Uh, and, and this all relates to movement, which is why I'm, I'm discussing it here, that we're talking a little bit about combat. One of the other things is, you know, when you get to your combat phase, if you have units that are, uh, you know, have now been uh, essentially engaged in the Zoc of, of enemy units, and, and very generally, uh, most units have a Zoc, um, unless they become, you know, uh, routed and disordered and such. But uh, the way this is arranged, like, if this unit wasn't here, then we have to attack these guys with this guy while these guys attack here. Like, that's what we have to do. So as long as there's another enemy um, engaged or adjacent, they have to be involved in a combat. And what that could even mean is if for some reason these guys were back here, we would have to, as the Austrians here, have to attack both these guys and these guys um, with this poor one-step unit because, well, he's surround, you know, he's almost surrounded. He has to fight with the units that are nearby. As a cavalry unit, though, he could withdraw away from the infantry. So that's a special ability of cavalry. Um, he would probably want to do that in this case. So there is this, you know, and I've seen this rule used in other games. To varying degrees where if you have a frontage of units that are involved in combat, they're going to have to fight. They're, they're just going to have to fight one way or another. Um, and so you want to use the, your movement phase to look at where are units engaged that maybe they're going to be in a losing position and you want to try to reinforce um, that unit by moving a unit into their flank to offset the enemy that's going to be flanking them um, and uh, spread out the pain, so to speak. Um, so that's a very important part of the combat. And you can imagine, you know, as units start to retreat or withdraw, in the case of cavalry withdrawing away, that, you know, you can end up with now open flanks or open positions where you can get two hexes attacking one hex. And that's actually super important to the combat, but we'll talk about that uh, here in just another couple minutes. But what I, the, the, quick thing I would say is anytime that you're able to cleanly cleanly attack one hex from two hexes, you should, because that's how you're going to be able to get better than one-to-one -one odds. Very generally, you'll find that, like here, these two units together, their strength numbers, which is the number to the left here, uh, three and four together make seven. Seven to six is one-to-one -one odds after uh, rounding down against the attacker. It's one-to-one -one odds, right? One hex to one hex, it's going to be even odds, and the combat results aren't great. But if you're able to start, um, again, just by way of example, having it set up that these guys are attacking, that seven points. This guy is attacking here with another eight points. It's now 15 to six. That's two-to-one odds, um, and that's much better, right? Uh, or at least two-to-one odds. And that is much better. Uh, in terms of the, the combat die result, you know, the CRT is much better for two to one than one to one. So creating those circumstances where you get the two to one hex actually shifts things a huge amount. And that's that decision between do you want units in reserve in support underneath these guys, or do you want to swing them around and attack, you know, from another angle? There's, there's pros and cons to that. If these guys start to fall apart and get pushed away, this unit could then, you know, be advancing and then creating um, a lot more trouble for these guys. And that kind of thing will start to happen in the combats as the, the fighting continues. Um, so that's 
<laughs> that's a lot to talk about for movement. There's one other aspect that I want to show that will be important as we start talking about combat, and that's how the artillery is affected by movement. Uh, generally, anyone who's not a Prussian, if this stack, including the artillery, moves, say, to here, which is into the Zoc of an enemy unit, even just one that's just an infantry sitting here, that forces the artillery to now go to the bottom of the stack and they can no longer fire at all uh, because they're just, you know, they, they lag behind the rest of the infantry. The infantry protects them. But now uh, we can't get the artillery up top to actually fire on the Prussians, uh, which makes it very hard to advance. And now we can't even use that artillery at all. Uh, so very generally, what you would rather be doing is just moving your units to where you think the Prussians are going to advance into and have your artillery at the top of that stack. So if these guys move here, these guys stay on top of the hex and can fire uh, artillery uh, bombardment against the enemy. A special ability of the Prussians is that if the Prussians move forward into an enemy Zoc, like so, they actually get to keep their artillery on the top of the stack. And that ends up being a really important tactical advantage of the Prussians where you know, they can move forward. If if a caval uh, if an artillery unit moves, you're supposed to put a uh, artillery moved marker on that sucker, and he can't fire that same player turn. But now, because the Prussian player always goes first, when it's the Austrian turn next, this artillery is now in a position to do defensive fire right away. Um, and so there is that that major tactical advantage in artillery positioning. Oh that really affects the, um, uh, the choice of where you move and how you move as the Prussians. Um, so let's, that's a good segue into talking about bombardments. Let's talk about that next. So once you've completed your movement in your player turn, you then have your offensive bombardment phase. And this is where you're able to have your artillery fire on the enemy based on their ranges and a couple of constraints. So one of the constraints is that um, if, uh, if an enemy is adjacent to one of your units and artillery is not in that stack, so just as an example here, if these guys were down here, this artillery could not fire on this unit because these guys are kind of in the way. It's too dangerous to fire. Um, but these guys could fire at this stack because there's no friendlies adjacent to it. If we started the turn and these guys were already here and maybe the, you know, the Prussians moved up and the Austrians still have their artillery at the top of the stack, and this is when they started the offensive bombardment phase, they could fire adjacent here or here because they're adjacent themselves. So they're not in danger of accidentally hitting their buddies. So they're going to fire, be able to fire at one of these hexes they can choose. So that's sort of the limitations on, on that. Artillery tend to have uh, three uh, different strengths based on their range. So you can see here there's an eight, four, and a two. So eight is the bombardment strength of this artillery unit when adjacent to its target. It has four if it is two hexes away, right? One, two. So if we fired from here to here, that would be a four strength. And then from three hexes away, it's just a two. Now, what you can do during this phase is combine fire. So we could have this artillery and this artillery both fire here, and we add four plus uh, to a six, and we'd instead be rolling on the six column of the bombardment table, which uh, you can see here. So you can, you can get actually pretty high based on the concentration of your fire. Um, and then there are a few die roll modifiers. So like if you are firing at one hex range, not only are you having better bombardment factors, you also get a plus two to your die roll, but things like slopes and other terrain adjustments can affect uh, your die roll for firing, and you generally want your, your uh, artillery to not be disordered, um, and routed units are kind of harder to hit. They're bobbing and weaving and running away, so there's a little bit of a penalty for that. Um, but generally, offensive bombardment, um, other than if you are just, you know, there's continuing to be a fight right next to one another here. Uh, a bomb offensive bombardment will be sort of peppering the enemy uh, for minor step losses as they approach. So 
you know, again here, if we had these two firing here, you know, at best, we're probably, you know, if we're really lucky, we're going to get maybe two steps, more likely one step of losses against the Prussians. But even one step can be very important because it could mean, just use this unit as an example, that it is a six strength, seven morale, which is pretty darn potent. Well, now it is much weaker, even losing one step, and now has five strength with six morale, and the six morale is much easier to match by the Austrians uh, than a seven is very typically in the system. So uh, if you have artillery, you definitely want to be using it, be targeting units, trying to weaken them or take you know the polish off, uh, off, of, off of them before they get too close where things will end up being bloody, where you can basically force you know an, a quality advantage uh, away uh, for, from one side or the other with some well positioned artillery. Again, for the Austrians in this case, they're, they're much more defensive, bombardment minded because they can't advance with their artillery on top of the stack. So they're wanting to get into some good position, forcing the Prussians to have to try to assault them or where they can get off some good offensive shots along the way. Now there are some line of sight rules. I'm not going to try to explain all of them. They're, they're not usually a big deal but you'll definitely want to uh, look at that in the rule book and, and watch out for situations where maybe artillery doesn't actually have uh, a good line of sight. Once you're done with your offensive bombardment, you're going to have a rally phase, which means any units that maybe have become uh, disordered or something, uh, you have a chance to relieve them, or if they were routed, they'll go from routed to disordered. And basically what that is, is you look at the unit's present morale. So look at this guy, that's a five. Uh, you'll you'll want to roll a die and you're going to want to roll lower or equal to its morale rating. There are a few modifiers that are on the terrain, or I'm sorry, the player age sheet, um, where you can see, you know, if that unit kind of has a way to hunker down, that will help them. Um, and these are modifiers to the morale value, not the die roll. Uh, but you can see if they're right next to an enemy or the army is demoralized or broken, then it's harder to rally. Um, and disordered isn't so bad. If you take enough losses and retreat, you become disordered. Uh, but you are susceptible to cavalry charges uh, because that gives a lot of bonuses to the attacker. Um, and you just have a harder time getting back into shape when disordered. Routed is obviously very bad. And to get a unit from routed back to fully formed is going to take a couple turns and you might not have the benefit of being able to do that well. One of the other important things that happens is that you do movement before rallying, so you kind of have to make a decision. So a special rule is that cavalry disorders after every combat they are in, just because that is what happens with cavalry um, that during this time, right? They, they do whatever they're doing, but you know, fighting just kind of makes things disorganized for the cavalry. You have to decide, are you going to try to make the cavalry do something else? So if they move, if these guys were, you know, disordered, let's say, you do movement before rallying. So you have to decide, am I going to send these guys in? And I better hope that I can roll uh, a one through four, because while their morale is five, um, being adjacent to an enemy makes that one worse. So I need, you know, it's a 66% chance that I'm going to roll what I need to make them ordered before the combat phase where I'm going to need them to be in good shape. So there is a, then a decision being made even during movement to figure out, well, these guys are disordered. Do I expect them uh, to be able to rally? And things like these leaders with the bonuses also tend to, to be an important factor uh, for those units being able to rally. When that is complete, you get the defensive bombardment. And really, defensive bombardment is the only opportunity you have during your opponent's turn to make decisions or do anything. And, and basically what that is, is, you know, your artillery, if they're adjacent to an enemy, so they have to be adjacent, um, can fire. So in, in this case, if it was like this, we'd have both of these artillery, since they're both adjacent to an enemy, uh, fire with 8 plus 3 is 11 bombardment strength plus two to the die roll is probably going to be pretty gnarly and deal multiple steps of losses against these guys. But these guys could not fire because they're not adjacent to any enemy. So defensive bombardment only for those units that are adjacent. Uh, artillery that is at the top of a hex 
and adjacent to an enemy, you get that defensive bombardment opportunity. And what that could ha what that could cause to happen is you deal deal enough step losses uh, that it forces these guys to retreat. And when it comes to uh, the Prussian attack phase, well, now they're no longer adjacent. Um, that combat doesn't happen. You basically uh, manage to deflect them with artillery fire and canister shot before the charging Prussians can actually, um, you know, make their assault. And so that's, again, a critical, important piece of ensuring that your artillery is well positioned in a tough, tough spots where, yeah, if you're trying to assault up a hill at artillery with canister fire, you're probably going to have a bad time and you're going to need to be very careful with how you choose to do it. But keep in mind that, let's just say we're over here, if these guys have come up like so, and these guys have come up like so, or maybe I need to arrange this a little bit differently here. Um, if, if it's possible for this stack to be attacked by two different units, during defensive bombardment, the Austrians have to pick one hex to fire at. They can't fire at both. So when you, when just in terms of strategy, if you want to assault a position with artillery uh, as a defensive measure, uh, you're going to have to do it from multiple hexes. So again, that's where that tactical positioning of getting units in where you can um, circumvent the measures of your opponent. So, you know, yeah, that artillery is going to be tough to knock out and take that hex. Um, but if you can attack it from multiple angles, there's only so many places that artillery is going to be able to fire and uh, that's how you start to make inroads against a defensive position like that. Okay, so in, in regards to the actual combat phase itself, which is sort of the, you know, and I should say close combat phase is how it's referred to in the rules, this is really the last major activity of a player turn. And if you've been paying attention to this video, you'll understand how uh, movement, positioning, uh, presence of artillery and whether or not they're at the top of a stack um, all influence kind of you know what the end result could be when units finally clash in the conventional close combat phases so keep that in mind as I start talking through some of this that you know obviously all of those factors feed into how a combat could go there's a lot of nuance in the combat system here and I'm probably not going to be able to address every single thing that is a part of it, or this video would be even much longer than it already is. Um, but keep in mind that there are things that are constantly uh, evolving in a, in a given turn as to how those combats are going to go, and that's really the heart of how the, the game is played, is figuring out the best ways for those combat situations to be advantageous uh, to you. So uh, with that, I'll also mention that once you have units that are adjacent in these situations here, um, unless one side starts to retreat or is eliminated, once those units are actually involved in a combat, they're going to stay uh, engaged in combats for quite some time. So on the Prussian player turn, you know, this guy is attacking... Um, depending on how these guys are oriented, I'll shift things around again. Like, this guy's going to attack here. This guy's going to attack here. These guys are going to attack here. You're going to have to do that on the Prussian player turn. And if these units are still all together, maybe they've chipped away a step loss or two. When it's the coalition player's turn, these guys are going to attack here. These guys are going to attack here. And these guys are going to attack here. And it's going to go back and forth like that until somebody breaks uh, or takes enough damage to have been eliminated in that sort of thing. Um, so you really want to be careful as, as either the battle scenario or the main scenario, you know, when these things start to get in, in the place and folks start fighting, uh, while you can do the sort of disengagement for a penalty maneuver that we talked about before with the minus two, units that are in fight mode are going to stay in fight mode and until something breaks up, uh, one way or the other. And again, you want your strength advantage to be there. You want the hex, uh, you know, attacking hexes to defending hexes to be advantageous, and you also want your morale levels to be high. And the morale rating of a unit is this smaller number right here. So five there, six here, and so on. 
when you do the combat, uh, again, you're going to have to designate your combats. And, and again, looking at who all is adjacent to each other and engaged and making sure that every unit that is in a Zoc is basically going to conduct combat. That's probably the easiest way to explain that rule without going overboard. Uh, you can also do withdrawals before combat. So this tend to be either fast infantry or cavalry. If they're only being attacked by infantry, can simply decide to withdraw a hex, which is a, an advantage, but you may be giving up space uh, when you do that and units could potentially advance um, in some circumstances. If you're being attacked, uh, and I'll show an example down here, um, let's see if I can arrange a better example here. If this was like so, this cavalry unit could not withdraw from combat because a cavalry unit is accompanying the attack. So if it were only the infantry, this cavalry could withdraw away. Uh, but because there's cavalry involved in the combat, they cannot withdraw. So this is how you can kind of, you know, you get your own cavalry to start pinning uh, the opponent's cavalry, and then your infantry can be supporting uh, from another hex, and that can be a very valuable way to tie down enemy cavalry and try to eliminate them. Uh, so you can do that withdrawal. Otherwise, then you're going to compute the strength involved in the combat. So, um, you know, again, if, if it's something like here and here attacking here, we're adding up 8, and 3 is 11. Not quite 2 to 1 odds, and so it's going to end up being uh, 3 to 2 odds, potentially, uh, for this, which is a distinct um, column on the combat re results table. We're also having to pick a lead unit. So this would be the unit that's going to take the first step loss in the combat. For the defender, that's going to just tend to be that top unit. <clears throat> the attacker is going to have to select one. So we might pick um, out of these two. It maybe doesn't matter, but this one has more steps. So we might pick this unit. If there was a difference in... Uh, morale and say this morale and let's give this guy a step back um oh he's got the same morale on both no he doesn't uh, okay if it were like this we'd probably pick this infantry unit because they have a morale of six compared to a morale of five of this cavalry so we would pick this as our lead unit um and then we're going to determine our die roll modifiers now there's a whole set on the player aid chart but to summarize some of the main ones are if it's uh, infantry involved in the combat and uh, whoever side has better morale for their lead unit will get either a plus one or a minus one. If all the attackers are cavalry and the attacking lead unit has a higher morale, then your bonus actually is the difference in morale. And that can be very, very potent when you're attacking with uh, your units that are attacking either hurt units that have lost steps already or are disordered where if you imagine for a second um let's see if i can craft up a situation uh based on what's on the board here um oh, i'm gonna have trouble with that uh let me throw a couple of things out here so in this situation below, uh, if this stack was attacking from here to here, um, it would be 5 to 5. That's a 1 to 1 odds, but we would get a plus 1 for the morale difference. If this unit was down to its last step and its morale was only a 2, because again, all cavalry attacking, the difference, 5 to 2 is a plus 3, these, this cavalry would actually get a plus 3. So that's, again, part of the functions of cavalry, that if it's all uh, attackers being cavalry and you have a morale advantage, you're going to get a tremendous bonus to attack. You also get uh, bonuses if every defending hex has a disordered unit and only cavalry are attacking, then that's even more bonuses. That's a plus two. Um, and, of course, you get additional bonuses if you're attacking somebody who is... Uh, also routed, you get a similar type of, of bonus. Um, even infantry that are attacking uh, a disordered or routing unit is going to get some bonuses there. 
So it definitely plays into the idea that once a unit is starting to get beaten up, maybe on the retreat, maybe disordered, they're going to be much more susceptible to being attacked very generally. Um, terrain affects things. Uh, there's also uh, a case where you can have uh, a, um, how do you want to, how do I want to refer to this? It's the bonus for being flanked, and in, in a flanked uh, attack in this case means that um, you're being attacked on at least uh, through, through two opposing hex sides here. So, um, you know, you're being attacked uh, Zox and units surrounding the unit on all sides. That's a flank attack, which would provide another plus three. You can offset that a bit by having extra units in the stack. So if this were uh, a two-step and a three-step unit, meaning that only one of these units is in the front hex, you might say, oh, well, these guys are going to be attacked from behind, uh, you know, as an abstraction, but there's a unit here with it, and you actually will get to count the support unit underneath as part of the combat strength of the defending stack, because you can interpret it as like, oh, these guys are fighting the front unit, but in the back where they're being flanked, the support unit is there to fight as well. And when you have that kind of situation where a support unit is fending off a flank attack, it actually increases the step losses for both sides. So it can get kind of bloody uh, doing that. Some additional uh, modifiers are going to come in with the cavalry shock. So if you look here, uh, you'll notice that both of these units have the, uh, the triangles uh, next to their strength. So two, two triangles here, two triangles there. These are shock icons, and it basically means that when you're com uh, computing combat, if you have, uh, you know, you count the number of triangles involved in the combat, so in this case, just these two for the front unit. And you look at how many units are involved in the combat. So let's just say it's two, two units engaged. You uh, divide the number of triangles by the number of units, and you get a modifier, and you round up. So it's usually maybe a plus one. But sometimes you'll be able to get a case where um, you, know, you could get up to plus two. You we might need some additional units here. But if it's one, two you know, three, say we had another one there. Um, I'm not going to be able to grab an example here. Uh, maybe something like that, that there's, you know, uh, mathematically, I guess he would have to have two triangles. But, um, you know, basically you, you could eventually get up to the point where you could get an even up to a plus two for the shock. So it does matter where the heavy cavalry uh, uh, the you know, tend to be the ones with more shock triangles will provide even additional uh, modifiers to that die roll. Um, and so, you know, you're really fighting to find the DRMs because the DRMs matter quite a lot on the combat results table. If you look, you really don't want to be caught in a one-on-one -on -one combat with no modifier or even just a plus one might not be enough because the one-on-one -on -one CRT is, is pretty rough for the attacker. You, it, so if you can't get good, you know, two to one odds or three to one odds, you're really going to want to figure out a way to drive those DRMs up so that you're able to score pretty well on the actual results table, such that you're not going to take much in the way of losses, but the defender is. Now, um, one of the things that's going to matter and is really part of the nuance of the game system that you wouldn't really realize on first blush, but reading the designer notes will help, is that as the units take step losses, not only do their strength decreases, but their morale decreases. And so the longer that a unit is fighting and the more damage it takes, the less capable it's going to be. And very generally, you'll notice from battle to battle that the coalition forces, the rate of strength and morale losses when they take step losses differs. So some factions like the Russians actually maintain pretty coherent uh, morale despite step losses. And that's going to factor into your tactical uh, decision-making during the combat and how you're going to line up attacks and who's going to attack where. So even here, you know, if both these units took a step loss, um, just making the comparison from here to here, Austrians still have a lot of strength, but now their morale uh, is starting to run out. And what will happen is a three-step unit 
that is going to take a step loss um, ultimately gets replaced by a new counter. So we're going to set him off to the side for a second. And here's now down to the third step. You can see the morale's down. It drops from six to four, which is a big loss, and the strength continues to drop. Um, and so that's that need to use artillery or some other method to start to knock down the steps such that the morale and the strength is low enough that your units can compare. Uh, and, and typically we'll find that the Prussians have all around strengths here. Uh, the Austrians start to become very brittle after a while. Uh, the Russians can maintain morale a little bit better compared to the other coalition factions, but you're really going to want to watch, you know, can that unit sustain a loss before its levels really start to deplete? And in fact, um, one last bit of nuance I'll try to hit, because I think it's important to the game, that the morale effects in combat after you've taken losses matter a whole lot. And the key numbers that matter are uh, morale of five, four, and three. So, so long as a unit can maintain a morale of five after taking step losses, uh, it can remain in a hex. So even if it receives a, a retreat result on the CRT, if its morale is five, it can stay put. If its morale is four, uh, it may have to retreat. And uh, if the uh, unit has a four morale like right here, and let's say they, they took a step, let's say they, maybe they had to take two step loss, so they took a step loss, now they're down to four. Instead of losing another step, as that next step loss, this unit's going to retreat one hex and become disordered. If a unit gets knocked down to three morale, then it's going to automatically route if it has to take another step loss. And so this is where you start to see the lines getting broken up because eventually the morale of an individual unit will drop enough that it will either be required to route or disorder or retreat or what have you. And some units, just by the strength of their morale, will be able to maintain their position. Um, and so that's another sort of nuance to the tactical uh, clashing of arms here where uh, once you start to disorder and route, you either needed to have a unit in support that could continue fighting, or now there's a hole in the line, and we can start to get that two-on-one hex situations that we described earlier. So there's actually a lot here to kind of peel back and understand and operate with when we're talking about the actual combats, how things are conducted, and, you know, what are you doing even in a given battle? So as this battle stretches across, you know, the, the 10 hexes or 12 hexes or whatever we're dealing with, there are these little situations zoomed into these hexes where you have to think about, can this unit hold out? Can it last another, you know, turn of die rolling before I can get some reinforcements in or some support units or create a breakthrough somewhere else on the opponent's line uh, before I can get my artillery in a place where they can really fire and push the Austrians back, that kind of thing, are all parts of the decision-making that you're making, decision-making that you're doing as you're playing the game. And I'll leave the, you know, I guess there's one other, there's one other special mechanic that can happen, which is um, a sweeping charge. So after you advance after combat, uh, assuming that you've forced the defender to vacate, any formed cavalry that advanced uh, can perform a sweeping charge wherein basically they get to do a follow-on attack. And the way that you're supposed to do this is uh, with some, uh, let's see if I can find the best example of this, um, would be here where we attack this stack against this stack. Maybe we've caused a retreat and this guy advances. The supporting unit underneath him can actually advance with him. And when that happens, the first cavalry unit is disordered because all cavalry units disorder after a combat they're involved in. But this guy, who was a support unit, when they advance, they can actually switch their stacking. And the, the uh, disordered unit can be at the bottom. The fresh unit is on top. And there's a circumstance where if we dealt more step losses than could be inflicted on the defender uh, before they retreated we could potentially get a momentum marker, which means that on a follow-up attack, we get it plus two DRM. And so this guy, as part of a sweeping charge, 
uh, could actually do a follow-up attack with an additional bonus, in addition to any other bonuses, and uh, attack this unit again. Now there's, again, I, I'm, I'm getting into the depths of details of all these different mechanics, but there's a lot here to be considering. This is not, despite it being a fast playing game, there is actually a lot of things you need to consider. And if, if you're blowing through the mechanics and you're not really focused on applying the concepts, then you might not be as effective versus somebody who has figured out, here's how I'm going to use my artillery, here, here's how I'm going to use my cavalry to, to make a penetration and then do a sweeping charge and really mess up the line. That player is going to be much more effective at the game. So there's, there's a lot you can read into in the rules on that. Um, I, I'm just, just barely giving everything a light brush of attention, but there's plenty here to, uh, to operate with. Finally, I want to wrap up the, the gameplay section of this video by talking about the joint morale adjustment. So something that's going to happen is for every unit that you've caused to rout or for each unit uh, counter that is removed from the map. So if you have a, a four-step unit of the enemy and you force them to take a step loss and then take another step loss to be replaced by its other counter, you basically have removed this counter from the map. That counts as a combat success, and again, so does routing for the elimination of units. And you mark that by uh, a mnemonic of having these combat success markers. So if we did that as the Austrians, and you could put it you know, wherever it's convenient, say, hey, we got a combat success. Maybe in another combat, we route that unit. Now we have another combat success. And this is important. You want to get combat successes in groups of threes. Um, every unit that is taken off the board is placed on the morale track. So this is kind of a weird part of the game system. I think this could be clear for people um, if they had done it a different way, but I understand why they operate it this way. So when you take, we lose this unit, the Prussian puts this on the spot underneath their morale marker if it's empty. If we lose another unit or another counter, it goes here. If we lose another one, it goes here. Um, and the Austrians are likewise counting up combat successes, again, with this mnemonic. Um, and let's say that, for whatever reason, uh, we're up to a three, and the Prussians have lost, you know, so many units, and maybe this guy is routing. What's going to happen is when you get to that uh, joint morale adjustment phase, um, and I'll just say that the Austrians lost some units for the sake of example here. What's going to happen is there we go. That's a better example. All right. So both sides have lost some units and both have some combat successes. And so we're going to do the, uh, the morale phase. So for all of this, we'll say that uh, the Austrians have five combat successes, and that can be discerned by eliminating one, two, three, four Prussian units, and there's a routing Prussian unit. So five combat successes. The Prussians have three combat successes because they've managed to eliminate three Austrian counters. Um, so when we go to do the morale phase, what we do is we look at uh, how many combat successes the Austrians have? We have five. Unfortunately, that's not enough for two sets of three, so we only get one morale improvement for three, the remaining. So we pull these away, we get we have three. So we take the lowest counter and we go one, you know, two, and then we move all these guys up to three. So the, the losses are still there. Uh, we've just moved them up to three. And then... We adjust the morale marker to wherever the lowest box is that contain units, and then we would shift the morale down for any other routing units. The Austrians, in this case, don't have any routing units. That's where they stay. For the Prussians, they got one set of three combat successes. They get to take the lowest marker and move it up one. Now we drop the morale marker down to the bottom, and then because the Prussians have one routed unit, the morale goes down one more. And if the Prussians were to lose another unit, just grabbing one for example, we would put it on the next empty space underneath the morale marker. 
and continue to put eliminated units along this track, occasionally having them shift up based on combat successes. Now that sounds a little fiddly, but what it represents is that as you're losing units and, and various things are occurring, your morale is dropping, but that can be offset by actually being successful in combat. So you can be taking losses, but if you're generally winning fights, you can be in still pretty good morale shape. But as things start to drop and drop and drop, and you start to have morale losses and routing, that morale marker is going to continue to go down until it hits a threshold on here where the demoralized markings are. So if the Prussians get knocked down eventually, having lost so many units or having so many routed units, they're in some of these boxes, there is a die roll chance that they become demoralized. And what that will mean is it forces, when your force becomes demoralized, for every unit of yours within three hexes of an enemy unit, has to pass a morale check or become disordered or even routed. Um, and then from there, it's usually downhill. So you're really fighting to avoid demoralization. And then once one side becomes demoralized, they're very likely going to lose, other than the potential that, you know, the winning force also becomes demoralized. And then it becomes a real, you know, hard fought, uh, you know, exhausted army facing exhausted army situation. But that tends to greatly influence uh, the victory conditions and who's winning and everything else. You can also accrue victory points for capturing units, and that's built into the combat results table, uh, as well as capturing artillery, which means attacking an artillery position and advancing into the artillery hex, uh, where you can potentially capture those steps, and they're worth a huge number of victory points. All that said, because I've talked about so much in this, and this video is going to be very long for this reason, I'm going to kind of cut it there. But hopefully that gives you a very good sense of how all the systems work together. I do think that it's a very interesting system uh, and allows for um, a lot of tactical decisions to be made. There's things that you need to keep an eye on for morale purposes, the positioning on the map, what units are fighting where, how are you leveraging your artillery, how are you leveraging your cavalries and their charges, and when can they snipe on uh, disordered or weakened enemy units. All of that stuff is factored into the game system, and it feels right for the time period. Um, and very generally, it makes for interesting puzzles as you're fighting through the battles, um, even solitaire. You know, you, you, you know, especially if you're not familiar with the reduced strength values of units, and you're just kind of playing through. All of a sudden, you know, you have new emergencies that need to be rectified, uh, and it makes for some fun stuff. So I think that's enough of covering the game mechanics. I think I hit a lot. Um, that can always be supplemented by reading the rulebook yourself. Let's uh, switch over to my final thoughts on the game and uh, wrap, uh, wrap this thing up. Okay, so what did I think of the game? Well, I've realized now after doing some review videos that trying to assign a rating, a grade, um, is not terribly helpful. Uh, so, you know, I might rate a game a certain number on Board Game Geek in my own notes or something um, just so I can align it with how I really enjoyed it and how much I liked it as a very subjective thing. And, and there's an accepting that reviews are always subjective, even if we try to be objective. So I, I don't feel like I'm going to be doing sort of like you know, 8 out of 10 grade B type of ratings uh, here into the future. I think it's really important to focus in on what is this game good at and and what will not work for folks and let you kind of decide if you know what bucket you fall into. Generally speaking, um, you know, if the thesis of this whole exercise was to find out is this a bad game or is this a good game that folks are ignoring, I think I'm ending up on the scale of it's a good game that folks are ignoring. Now, couple of things. Uh, what has spurred some of this on, uh, in addition to some of the commentary about how the game's been available, was that, uh, you know, folks were looking at the game, maybe they had seen some other videos where there were complaints of scale and people having issues with the scale of the map or the units. Um, and, I, you know, it, it, there's something, I guess, there's something to that if you are walking into these games with a very specific expectation that when you start playing, it is the Battle of Torgau, only the Battle of Torgau, 
and none of the things that led up to the, what was the situation that caused the battle to go the way that the battle went. And to be honest, when we look at, you know, just how did these battles occur and what, what occurred in them, a lot of what has to do with how the battle wound up historically happening is because of the maneuvers done prior to the guns actually, you know, firing the muskets and the cannon firing of the opposing sides, that the maneuver is a critical component of the battles of Frederick, which is what this game is really focused on. So if there are folks that, that really don't want to deal with that and want to deal with the battles in a more zoomed in fashion, um, you know, I have seen those Clash of Arms games, uh, you know, Battles of the Age of Reason or whatever it is, um, which I've not played, as really good games, or the games one should focus on, but but it, it as far as I can tell, and I've done a little bit of looking, but maybe I've not seen everything, those do tend to be much more zoomed in, and they're pretty big games that take a while, and so I can certainly see where, like, that is what you're after, um, but I think this game provides something that is at least, if not unique, at least valuable for the evaluation and, uh, I guess, engagement with the Seven Years' War and Frederick the Great as a historical topic. And I think that is important and that is very useful. Now, um, I'll point out that uh, there are some parallels that could be made to the operational series group uh, Library of Napoleonic Battles series by Kevin Zucker with this game. Um, very easy to make that comparison. Uh, and, and even in terms of how one should be thinking about the game design and what it's representing, um, there are some uh, issues of the OSG magazine that's available as PDF on the OSG website. Uh, I think it's like volume, I want to say volume three issues, one, two, three, and five that include a bunch of design notes from Kevin Zucker that talk about how, you know, what you're seeing on the table is a representation of how the battles occurred. And there are certain things that are happening at a lower level than the game is showing, and you just know that it's happening, or happening in a slightly different way. Um, and just because you're not seeing it directly as the way you want to see it doesn't mean that that isn't being accounted for. And I think that's the case here with this game. Um, you are dealing with a more zoomed out approach where any unit that is in the front line is functionally, you know, that brigade at 500 yards operating uh, in its frontage, and you can have units stacked with it that are support. And if you were at a more zoomed in level, those units would be several, hex, maybe a hex behind the front row, but because we're a little more zoomed out, it, you know, there is a way to represent that supporting unit. And the game does it in a way that I think is actually fairly clever and it's not terribly complicated. I mean, if you were trying to, you know, the, your first time reading the rules, that could be tricky as you try to wrap your head around what's happening. But if you read the designer notes, all of a sudden, if you were having any issues, that gets cleared up pretty quickly. Um, and ultimately, you know, again, it, it making a, a relation a little bit to OSG, uh, Library of Napoleonic Battles, the maneuvering main scenarios provide, uh, you know, it's really that maneuver phase of being able to see the entire environment around where the battle occurred. And if you're playing the main scenario, you have this flexibility to try out different things. And I did that. I in the battle uh, main scenario of Torgau, I decided, well, let's see if I can just do a frontal assault with the Prussians, and let's see how bad that, that's going to end up being, right? So let's just try it. And if, I, and if it really succeeds, maybe that would be an issue for the system. But as I found, it did, it did not succeed, um, to put it lightly. So that maneuver uh, main scenario capability of the game and the system provides, again, flexibility, the ability to do ahistorical things, and an exercise to see why the battles ended up the way that they did and the advantages of Frederick maneuvering while his opponents uh, stayed more or less, uh, you know, in, not terribly um, agile, we'll say, right? So uh, the battles themselves, um, where you can just jump right into the action, are probably one of the easier ways to just play the game in the system. The main scenarios do add a little bit of extra stuff you have to worry about that 
um, you may not always want to do, or you'll be satisfied with just playing the Battle of Zorndorf as is without uh, the main scenario, which is kind of how I did it. I just you know, felt like the, the situation was already interesting enough for the battle. And uh, really, you know, these battles don't last terribly long. They're usually five turns when you're doing just the battle, and that makes it easy to get to the table and clean up afterwards. You're, you're not sacrificing table space for prolonged periods of time while you have any single individual battle uh, set up. So it gives you the, the feel of the era and the battles and the tactics in a pretty small footprint, you know, a standard map size footprint, and the time uh, actually goes by pretty fast. It, 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 if you're, once you know the system, it goes by very fast. Now, um, as I had shown previously, there are a lot of little, you know, interesting mechanics that one has to keep in mind and how to play the game. So whether that's the shock cavalry bonuses and how to calculate that, um, the ways that morale can affect combat, the way that cavalry being involved in combat is very, can sometimes be very different than infantry, can mean that the rules I wouldn't say complexity, but there is something like someone's going to have to really sit there and read the rules and and appreciate that it's a game that actually does have you know the rules that are intended to represent the time period. Um, I, I had seen some accusations that that this system could be used for any war conflict, and I don't think that's true. Um, only so far as you know, cavalry as a function do exist across many eras and can be used in similar fashions. And, and that might be the extent of that. Um, so for what it is, it, it does execute well. The battles and the things that I'm thinking about while I'm doing the battles feel true to the history in terms of, you know, am I able to chase disordered units with my cavalry and basically disintegrate that uh, enemy force as a, as a fighting uh, formation, uh, you know, that's there. That is a part of it. Um, the in-column movement is this risk and gamble of getting somewhere quickly, but maybe being jumped uh, while still in column. That can be very dangerous. The way that artillery functions as really defensive, you know, shields, so to speak, where, you know, you have uh, an area of protection around the, uh, the cannons, uh, your artillery, and where they're situated, which means their position on the battlefield becomes very important, uh, getting into the right position uh, so that you're in good defensive terrain, that the enemy trying to assault that position is not going to want to be hit with all of the canister fire that you're going to potentially have there at a, at a one hex range. That all felt very good. And then even the added sort of strategic asymmetry uh, there, or tactical asymmetry, where the Prussians are able to move their cannon into enemy Zox, which they don't get to fire right away, but it means that, you know, the Austrians are basically going to get some close range artillery fire unless they can force the Prussians to retreat that moved into that position. So there's this sort of tension of the capabilities of the Prussians versus the Austrians, the Russians, the French, um, and what, what can be done on the field of battle. Um, one of the other criticisms I had heard was that all the action tends to, you know, congregate around three to five hexes or something. You'll see that in the board game geek comments. I don't think that's true. Um, I think in some cases you're certainly going to have a lot of action in a span of hexes that long, uh, but it, but it is longer than that typically in almost all the battles that we uh, engaged in, and it really just depends on how are you choosing to stack up your units, and that is a historical consideration that the commanders um, had to deal with. So whether you're saying I'm going to extend my frontage or I'm going to make sure that my front has good support or some balance of those two things, that's a, that's a thought process that you as the player will have to decide, you know, especially in the main scenarios where you're maneuvering, how do you want to have your stuff set up? How do you want this to go? Where are you going to concentrate? Uh, your efforts and your best units, uh, your most elite troops with the highest morale. You want those good matchups against your opponent. How do you get that into place? And once the fighting begins, um, you know you're you're really locked into a, a a slugging match. And from there, it just depends on how you can maneuver, 
How can you break a line? How can you get in supporting units? And all of that matches my understanding of the time period and the battles that occurred. So in terms of being able to represent the, the era, the conflicts, the tactics, I think the game does that well. It just does it in a, in a slightly more zoomed out fashion than maybe some other games, but you're also able to play it much faster and get through it much faster. And I think that is uh, of good value to somebody who wants to, who you know likes the topic of the Seven Years' War or Frederick the Great and wants to give it a shot. So I guess I would give it a, a basically a good a recommendation for folks that can look past some of the scale things. Um, if that doesn't bother you, and it, it really didn't bother me, um, this is a, a fun uh, set of battles that you can play. And again, you can play pretty quickly. Um, I'm, I'm pretty pleased with it, in fact. And I'm glad that one, this is off my shelf of shame. And two, it's a game that I quite like and would be happy to play uh, in the future, either solitaire or opposed. And uh, I've still got Prussia's Glory 2 to enjoy ahead of me using what is the same system, just additional battles. Um, so we may get to that in the near future here on the channel uh, as well. So I hope that this video is enlightening for those who have seen Prussia's Glory 1 or 2 and we're not sure about the quality of the game just due to the way that the secondary market is handling it and the, I guess, lack of a lot of uh, noise about the game over these last 20 years since the original publication of the first game. Um, but let me assure you that there's a fun game to be had here. Um, it may not hit your taste, so keep that in mind. If you say this game is not for you, I can understand that. But if you think it might be worth your while, uh, break it out and play it and, and see how it goes. If, you, if you've got an unpunched copy on your shelf that you've been ignoring for the last several years, take another look at it. If this game interests you and you can't get a hold of a, a Clash of Arms game uh, for the Battles of the Age of Reason or you want something that fits this solution, you want a faster playing uh, Battles of the Seven Years' War uh, solution, then I think this is a good game for that and you should pick it up at your local gas station. Uh, I'm sure it's on sale for very cheap. We'll, we'll put that in the, uh, the benefits category for this game as well, for better or for worse. So thank you, Bob Kalinowski, for designing this game, um, and I hope your, your more recent game uh, does well if you're somehow watching this video. And for everybody else, uh, again, hope this was of some value to you. If you get to playing it, let me know in the comments section down below what you think. Uh, if you disagree with some of this, I'd be interested to hear that as well. Uh, though I'm pretty set in my opinion at this point, having uh, devoted some time to playing through this game um, and continuing to play its sequel probably very soon. So thanks for watching, guys. Uh, take care. Keep gaming.